Hi everyone, I'm Nina Slee. I'm a fifth year student at the Columbia University MD PhD program, currently in the third year of my PhD or graduate studies in Dr. Angela Cristiano's lab. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and here's my Twitter handle if you need to reach me or have questions at the end of this video. So today I'm going to be presenting um, a couple slides on using mice to study hair growth, which is the focus of my PhD. In our lab, we primarily study hair and hair biology and other hair loss disorders. And before I start, just want to let you know that this presentation includes many pictures of mice in case you're not a rodent friendly person. Um, there aren't any graphic pictures, but I just wanted to let you know, so you've been warned. So to begin with a little bit about me, I'm from South Korea, which is this country on um, this Asian country on this little peninsula here next to China and Japan. And that's where I lived for most of my life. And I did all of my schooling there, essentially. Um, and I graduated from high school there. So I really moved to the United States since college. And I went to college at Princeton University, which is in New Jersey, and there I studied molecular biology um, and was able to do some scientific research, which really got me interested in pursuing this path as a career. And what really cemented this for me was during my third or junior year of college, um, the molecular biology department at Princeton had a study abroad program where um, you could take one class a week at the University of Oxford in England and spend the rest of your time doing full-time research in the biological sciences. And uh, for me, that was really important because there was no one in my family um, who was doing research or who was a scientist as a full-time career. So um, this really showed me what that kind of life would entail, and I ended up loving it enough to pursue it seriously. And so now I'm here in New York City at Columbia University studying to be a physician scientist. So in addition to my love for research, really from um, as early as I can remember, even though that sounds a little cliche, I know, um, I've always looked up to doctors. Um, I loved how they could help people, specifically in the realm of health and health education. Um, I looked forward to seeing the doctor, even though when I was sick, I thought there was so much um, to be said for making someone feel better, both physically and mentally. And I found that that really just jived well with my general interest in um, science, specifically biology, and then later in college with scientific research. And then I found out that being a physician scientist was a viable career path. And thanks to the help of many, I was able to embark um, on this career trajectory. So um, for anyone who's interested in this or wants to know more about this, um, definitely reach out to me. I'm really passionate about providing mentorship and advising, so um, I'm happy to take any questions. So now that I've talked a little bit about me, um, I just really want to get to the meat of this presentation, which is about hair, the um, topic of my PhD studies. So why study hair? Why is it important? You know, um, I, I must say full disclosure, before I started my PhD, I never fully appreciated the important biological functions of hair aside from its aesthetic and cosmetic importance. So if you think about it, um, for example, in a lot of animals such as polar bears here, hair is really important for thermal regulation and insulation and allows these animals to um, survive in cold environments. It's also important for sensation. We'll talk about this a little later, but the hair follicle is attached to a muscle called the erector pili muscle, and that's the muscle that makes your hair stand up when you're cold and have goosebumps. Hair also acts as a protective barrier. For example, your eyelashes help um, prevent things from getting into your eye and irritating it. 
And also really important, hair is one way people express their social and cultural identity. And so accordingly, hair loss is associated with significant psychological distress. And for me, as a physician scientist, a long-term goal I have is to um, help develop new cures and new treatments for um, hair loss and other hair loss disorders. So to get into talking about the hair follicle specifically as well as its surrounding environment within the skin. So um, the hair follicle, I like to think of as a little mini organ because like the heart or your lungs, the hair follicles also comprised of many, many different cell types that act together as one unit to form the hair shafts that come out at the top of your scalp. And um, in order for hair to continue growing, for example, your hair, for the most part, grows back even after it's been plucked or shaved. And that's because the hair follicle is a regenerative organ. And what that means is it undergoes cycles of growth as well as periods of um, relative quiescence and also regression. And we call this specific cycling behavior the hair cycle. So to walk you through this a little bit, we won't get into the nitty gritty. Some people do spend their whole lives devoted to just like a tiny part of this hair cycle. So I'll just provide a quick overview. Um, if we start with the growth phase here called anagen, um, anagen is when the hair follicle starts um, invaginating further downwards to produce this hair shaft that eventually um, comes out at the top of your scalp. And then as the hair continues to grow, grow and grow during antigen, and eventually it reaches a point where it starts to regress. And as you can see, climb back up towards the top of your skin in a process called catagen. And then once it's regressed enough, so as you can see here, here the distance here, um, where the hair follicle dives in deep into the skin and antigen is much longer than the distance here during telogen, um, once the hair follicle has regressed, and that's a relatively quiet phase, we'd like to say. Um, and then um, towards the end of telogen, something jump starts the hair cycle again so that it enters this growth phase, which then eventually it regresses, re enters the quiet phase, and then again re enters the growth phase, and so on in a continuous fashion. And this really makes the hair follicle a useful organ for studying stem cells, which are important for regeneration. So in order to study hair growth, we use mice as a model organism. So why? For, um, the biggest really reason is that in humans, we cannot generate mutations. We cannot readily collect skin samples because that involves taking a piece of your scalp here um, we can't just pluck the hair, we need the whole skin because as you saw earlier, the hair follicle really invaginates deep down into the skin. Um, so we can't do that um, in a readily accessible manner. And we also can't perform surgery in humans to study hair. For example, we can't just wound people's scalps and see what that does in terms of hair growth. Um, and other things to note about humans, this will be more obvious when I start to point out the differences with mice. Um, so for humans, the majority of hair follicles are in antigen, which again is that growth phase of the hair cycle. About 80 to 90% of the follicles on your scalp are in antigen. And hair cycling is not synchronized. So what that means is not all the follicles on your scalp currently are in the same phase. Usually they'll be synchronized in little patches, like this part will be an antigen, that part will be an antigen, this other patch will be an antigen, but um, not all the hair follicles, again, will be in the same phase of the hair cycle. Meanwhile, in mice, unlike humans, we can generate mice with mutations and specific genes that we want to study. Um, we can readily 
purchase or breed laboratory mice for the purpose of scientific research. And we can also readily collect samples or perform surgery in mice. Although I would really like to emphasize that we do everything we can to minimize the pain experienced by these mice. Um, and we try to do this in the most humane manner as possible um, so that we um, make sure that these mice are not used in vain. Um, and so to point out some of the other differences between um, hair in humans and mice, mice undergo multiple hair cycles throughout their lifetime. So again, um, the majority of human hair follicles are in antigen and they're in antigen for a long time, which is why our hair just continues to grow if we leave it without cutting it. But in mice, um, their antigen period is much shorter, which also means that they experience um, they go through the cycle multiple times. And um, unlike humans, again, for the first two hair cycles after birth, hair cycling is synchronized where all the follicles in a region will be in the same stage of the hair cycle. So that might become a little clearer with this picture. So this strain of mice um, is especially useful because the color uh, or the pigment of the skin on their back um, is a hint at what stage the um, hair follicles are in. So the darker regions mean that um, the hair follicles in that area are in antigen and are actively producing these hair shafts that will eventually come out. And um, the hair, hair cycle sort of occurs in this synchronized wave-like fashion where um, antigen or the growth phase starts here towards the nape of the neck and the top of the back and it starts traveling downwards in this very synchronized wave-like fashion which is very cool. So to get a little deeper into the hair follicle and the surrounding skin environment, um, the skin is made of two major layers, the epidermis and the dermis. Um, the epidermis in humans is made of these sublayers, and in mice, they're only about two to three cell layers thick. And then beneath the epidermis is the dermis, which is this whole area. And you see the erector pili muscle here attached to the hair follicle, which again is important for those goosebumps. Um, we also have nerves that are attached to the hair follicle because again, I told you hair is important for sensation. Um, we have glands here. We also have other immune cells that are around um, the hair follicle, and as well as blood vessels. And then beneath that, we have adipocytes, which are basically fat cells. So as you can see, the skin is a very heterogeneous organ with many, many different cell types contributing to its physiology. So now if we take an even deeper look at the hair follicle itself, so the hair follicle really starts developing while um, you're in the womb. And what happens is that the epidermis, again, this top layer of the skin, um, invaginates deeper and deeper and deeper into the dermis. And what sort of tells these hair follicle um, epidermal cells to invaginate down into the skin um, are these cells called the dermal papilla cells. And these cells basically tell the overlying epidermis to again come down and form this full-fledged hair follicle. And if you look at this fully mature hair follicle, you can see that there are many, many different cell types that make up this one hair follicle. Um, this is just a microscopic picture of what the hair follicle looks like. Again, you see the epidermis and the epidermis invaginating to form this hair follicle. This is the dermis, and then beneath the dermis, we have this adipocyte layer. As you can see, these like white circles here. And I would just like to point out a couple cell types. Again, we talked about the dermal papilla here, which instructs the epidermis to come down and form the hair follicle. You can see the dermal papilla here in this picture. Um, we also have melanocytes, which are important for producing the pigment of your hair follicles. So for example, I have black hair because these melanocytes produce a lot of this pigment. Um, we also have 
um, the bulge, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The bulge is home to the stem cells that are important for regenerating the hair follicle um, as it continues throughout the hair cycle. And without these stem cells in the bulge, the hair follicle is no longer able to continue producing um, this hair follicle throughout these different um, throughout these successive hair cycles throughout life. So for every compartment of the hair follicle, there actually is a mouse model or many mouse models that we can study to, in order to study the function of that compartment. So in biology, just the general theme is that if we have a gene that we're interested in and we want to know what its function is, many times we will either try to delete the gene or we will try to um, make a mutation in the gene that prevents it from functioning. And when we look at what happens when the gene is no longer there or no longer functions, then we can infer what that function will actually be when the gene is present. So um, accordingly, we have uh, mouse models with either mutations or um, that have um, deletions in genes that are, for example, important for stem cell function in the bulge. So if this gene doesn't function, the stem cells won't function, and then the hair follicle will no longer be able to regenerate. We also have uh, mouse models that have mutations or deletions um, in genes that are important for dermal papilla cells, melanocytes, um, and all of these mutations can really alter in patterns of hair growth, um, shaft shape, or in the case of melanocytes, pigmentation. And um, that can help us really infer the functions of these genes and in turn the functions of these specific compartments and how they're important for hair growth. So today I'm just going to be walking through a couple of my favorite mouse models um, to show you uh, how these mouse models are used to study um, gene function, specifically in the context of hair biology. So to start with, um, FGF5 mutant mice are um, have a mutation in a gene called fibroblast growth factor 5, or again, in short, FGF5. And these mice develop very, very long hair, as you can see here. Um, and this is because they remain in antigen, which is, again, the growth phase for the, of the hair cycle for a longer time. So if you think about it, if normal mice, for example, spend about like a week to 10 days in antigen, and a mutant mice spends two weeks, three weeks in antigen, then they're obviously going to have longer fur. And it is um, because FGF5 mutant mice, where the FGF5 gene does not function, the, because these G, um, mice have longer fur, you can infer that when this gene is actually functioning, um, its function is to shorten or limit the phase of um, growth. And another thing we like to do in biology is to look at which cells are responsible for expressing this gene. And um, if you look at this picture here, this picture is where we um, specifically stain for um, cells that express this gene called FGF5. And you can see um, the positive staining in this dark brown and we see that FGF5 is expressed in these outer layers of the hair follicle during the later stages of antigen or hair growth. So FGF5 mutations also are known to affect hair length in other organisms besides mice. So here we see that donkeys with FGF5 mutations have longer fur. We see this in rabbits, we also see these in hamsters, goats here, and also in humans. Um, my advisor, Dr. Angela Cristiano, found that FGF5 mutations in humans cause humans to form these really, really long eyelashes. And that condition is called hypertrichosis. Trico, um, that um, is a prefix for hair, and hyper just means more of, so more hair, hypertrichosis. 
So opposite to those um, FGF mice, we also have step three knockout mice. So, um, and these mice lose hair. As you can see here, these minus minus signs, they basically are saying that these mice do not have this gene called step three in their skin. And compared to these mice that do have um, step three, you can see that these mice no longer have any fur. So we know that STAT3 is an important transcription factor. And what that means is that STAT3 helps turn on genes in the cell. And specifically, it um, turns on genes that are important for cell growth, survival, and division. And if you think about what kinds of biological processes are needed for something to grow, you would want those, you would think that the cells that are important for it, for example, hair growth, need to divide, they also need to survive, right? Otherwise they won't grow. And they need to divide to form new cells that will help form the hair follicle and the eventual hair shaft that will come out of your scalp. So what step three does is it tells the cell, oh, you need to actually express all these genes that are important for things like cell growth, survival, and division that are later important for hair follicles to function and produce this hair shaft. Um, and so here, these mice were genetically engineered, sorry, so that the STAT3 gene is deleted or knocked out in skin cells. And again, as I mentioned, these cells, um, these mice, starting about at week three, they start losing hair. And these are some microscopic pictures. So in um, mice that do have STAT3, you can see these hair follicles forming um, and growing during the growth phase. But then um, in the STAT3 knockout mice, you don't see any of these hair follicles anymore. So those are mice that lose hair. So they are born with hair, but then they lose hair. These mice that are um, that are called DKK1 overexpressed mice, they never grow hair. So what does DKK overexpression mean? So these mice are genetically engineered to express higher than normal levels of this gene called DKK1. So in the STAT3 mice, I told you that they were genetically engineered to not have this um, STAT3 gene in the skin. These DKK overexpressed mice, um, they're, they sort of do the opposite where they're genetically engineered to really express high levels of DKK1 in the skin. And these mice, they never end up developing hair follicles. So these are um, relatively uh, newborn mice, probably about, you know, like maybe 10 to two weeks old. And as you can see, while these mice have developed jet black fur, these mice have never developed any fur. And this is because DKK1, the function of this gene is to um, inhibit a pathway that is important for hair follicles to develop. And this pathway is called the WIND pathway. So if DKK1 normally inhibits this um, pathway that's important for hair follicle development, if you increase the inhibitor many, many times, then the hair follicle is never going to develop. And that's what we see here. Um, there are also mice that develop curly or wavy hair. Um, for example, these TGFA knockout mice, again, knockout means that these mice do not have the gene TGFA. And TGFA or TGF alpha is a protein that's important um, we know for cell proliferation and um, just the development of tissues. And mice that were genetically engineered to knock out this gene are known to develop these curly hair and whiskers. As you can see here, these are the whiskers and these are the hairs. Um, and why this gene is important for skin and hair is still a mystery. I would like to point out again um, that People with curly hair or naturally wavy hair, this doesn't mean that they are all mutant for TGF alpha. Um, this is really just showing that when we genetically engineer 
the mice to not have the TGF alpha gene. When we create that situation, these mice develop wavy hair. And because of that, this suggests that TGF alpha might be important for keeping straight hair. But this does not say anything about why some people have curly hair and some people have straight hair. It just tells us about um, what specifically might be important, one protein that might be important for keeping straight hair straight. So now moving on to um, mice that develop gray hair. So these are ECL2 knockout mice. So sort of similar to the STAT3 and TGF-alpha knockout mice, these mice do not have BCL2. And as you can see here, these mice um, develop gray fur, whereas the mice that do have BCL2 still have black fur. And we know that BCL2 is a protein that's important for cell survival. So when cells don't have this protein called BCL2, they die in a process called apoptosis. And in the skin and hair follicle, BCL2 is especially important in the cells that make melanocytes. So melanocytes, as I introduced earlier, are the cells that are important for making pigment. And so if you don't have BCL2, the stem cells that are important for making melanocytes, they die off. And then because of that, the hair follicles don't have melanocytes, they don't have pigment, so they end up forming um, gray or white fur. So on a microscopic level, you can see here, these hair shafts from mice that do have BCL2, you can see dark pigment here, but then when you look at the knockout mice, you don't see that sort of pigmentation anymore. So moving on from mutant mice, I just wanted to point out some other um, hair loss or um, hair phenotypes that you see just naturally in mice, um, including old mice. So like humans, um, mice, when they age, they start developing hair loss. Um, as you can see here, these mice, um, this one has more extensive hair loss, but they do develop hair loss and they also develop gray hair graying like we do. Um, and depending on the strain, lab mice can live from anywhere between one, one and a half to three years. And generally, um, mice that are about two years of age are considered old. So these mice are about two years old and they uh, have started developing um, these hair loss and hair graying phenotypes. And what exactly causes hair loss and hair graying with age is still a mystery. Um, and again, we'd obviously want to reverse that process, but in order to reverse that process, we need to understand what causes it and we still don't know. So maybe if you enter the um, hair biology field, then maybe you can help figure out the answers to some of these questions. Another um, mouse model are these brown laboratory mice, and these mice develop patchy hair loss. So you can see um, little patches of hair loss in these mice. And the, this patchy hair loss is actually reflective of a disease called alopecia areata that affects humans as well. So alopecia areata, or AA for short, is an autoimmune disease um, that eventually results in patchy hair loss. And I'll explain what that is in a little bit. And these brown lab mice, or the C3H lab mice, they spontaneously develop alopecia areata. So as they age, they will start developing this disease um, and they will start losing hair in patches. And um, just to walk you through how this presents in humans, so humans with alopecia areata, sort of similar to these mice, they will have patchy hair loss. And this can eventually progress further to total scalp hair loss. And we know that um, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley um, has this hair loss dis disorder. 
And um, this can, again, eventually progress to total scalp and body hair loss. So as you can see, this patient does not have eyebrows or other forms of body hair. And our laboratory mice that have this um, hair, loss, hair loss disorder, um, they also eventually develop alopecia universalis where they lose all of their body hair. So as I mentioned earlier, alopecia areata is an autoimmune disease. And what this means is that your immune system, it normally is only supposed to attack viruses or other foreign objects that invade your body. But in autoimmune disease, this um, your immune system starts attacking your own body cells. And in alopecia areata, it specifically attacks cells that form your hair follicle. And so in normal, mi um, normal mice and nor um, humans who do not have this disease, we see that there is very um, little, um, there's a very little amount of immune cells that are surrounding the hair follicle. Again, in this diagram, there's barely any, but then if you look at this diagram, what happens in alopecia areata, the hair follicle becomes surrounded by these immune cells that attack the hair follicle, resulting in hair loss. Um, so here, again, CD8 is a marker of these immune cells, and here we're trying to look at uh, which cells in the skin or how many of these CD8 positive immune cells are in the skin. And in mice that do not have this disease, we don't see any CD8 T cells in the skin. But here in mice that do have disease, CD8, um, for example, here you see a lot of these CD8 um, immune cells around the hair follicle and the skin. And NKT2D is another marker of these killer cells. And you can see that they um, really are very, very present in high numbers in the skin and hair follicles of mice with alopecia areata. And so our lab actually um, really studies this disease in depth. And we found that um, this class of drugs called JAK inhibitors, when you um, apply them onto mice with this disease, after a few weeks, they start regrowing their hair. And we've been able to clinically translate this finding into humans, where if we give human patients with alopecia areata these JAK inhibitors, they also experience regrowth of hair. And I really just wanted to point this out um, because this is a great example of how mouse models can help us um, understand disease so that we can then develop new treatments for human disease, which is eventually what I would like to continue doing as a physician scientist after my training. So again, I hope I've um, convinced you that the hair follicle is a really, really cool and complex organ made of and surrounded by these many different cell types that are all in some way or another important for hair growth. So we talked about the immune system in the context of alopecia areata. Um, we talked about you know melanocytes that um, form the pigment for this hair follicle, as well as um, other cell types such as the dermal papilla and so on. And they're all really, really important for the hair follicle to function as this one unit that continues to regenerate and form the hair follicles that come out of your scalp. And um, again, I would really just like to drive the point home that mouse models are really, really important for us to understand um, how human organs function, how human um, diseases you know, develop and progress, and those findings um, help us, again, sort of like I showed you with the JAK inhibitor example in alopecia areata, form um, new treatments that help us um, treat patients with diseases and other disorders. So thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Again, um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My Twitter is at you too nice to me, as I showed in the beginning of this presentation. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.